So you can do that alone. And if you feel like it's required that you praise him in a large group, then you're depending on something from the group. You're depending on the emotions or the, the feelings that maybe uh, are surrounding you. But, but worship like that is not something that is horizontal. It's not like the horizon. It's something that's vertical. It must go between you and God. And, and it'll be very different. It's, it's not that many of you don't sing, uh, and that's okay, but you praise. And that praise comes not from the ability of a voice or the ability to to speak at all. It comes from a heart uh, of thanksgiving, a heart of gratitude. God then desires that somehow, because of us recognizing him, that somehow we reflect him. One time, Jesus was being asked uh, by taking a coin. They were trying to challenge Jesus and trying to catch him in something that would, that would cause him to, to be flustered or cause him to say something that wasn't true. And they, they took this coin in Mark chapter 12 and they said, whose face is on this coin? And Jesus said, well, the face on the coin is, or Jesus asked them, whose face is on this coin? And, and they said, well, the face on the coin is, is Caesar's. And they were saying, should we pay taxes? Should we even pay attention to the governments of this world or not? Should we just think vertically with God? How important are the things that are of this world? And Jesus said, if it's Caesar's face on the coin, then you render under Caesar what is Caesar's and you render under God what is God's. You see, everything that takes place in this earth, everything that takes place on this world are things that are important. They are important. Paying taxes, uh, being a good steward of the things that have been placed in your care. But there's a difference in things that are temporal and things that are eternal. And we all have to be mindful that, that the things that are, are temporal are anything that can burn, anything that can decay, anything that can go away. Even our physical bodies are temporal. So if someone uh, worships their body so much so that that, they, that that takes all of their time and they're not using any of their time for the glory of God or to be something that would draw people to Jesus, then, then once again they're focusing on something temporal and something that is not eternal. But God wants us to focus on eternal things. Now the eternal things are things that, that will last into and past eternity. Jesus even said there are things that you can do out of obedience to God, out of praise to God, that are like storing up treasure in heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said these things to God, and he put everything in physical terms so we could understand spiritual things. But he said these things to God are valuable like gold, silver, and costly stones. This song said, um, uh, Lord, you are more precious than the physical because he wanted us to understand things that were eternal. But when he said, talked about gold, silver, and costly stones in the, in the word, he talked about things that were somehow valued, valuable to God. But do you think gold is valuable to God in heaven? How many of you would say, no, that's not valuable? Why? Because he uses it for pavement. It's not like it's a, a valuable thing, but it seems, and he uses those, he takes physical pictures for us to understand spiritual things. Now, he does that with our lives also, and today we're going to look at two guys' lives. That word for image in the Greek, the Greek word for image that's found several times, many times in the Bible, is, does anybody know what the word is for that? It's the word icon. And that's what's found in the Bible that Apple didn't create, or Macintosh didn't create, or, or, or uh, uh, who is the other, what's the other one? Microsoft. The, those guys didn't create the icons because in the Bible, if you see the word image in the New Testament, it is the Greek word icon or icon. And so the, the icon means that it represents something. So when he said, whose icon or whose, whose image is on that coin, he was saying, uh, what does this look like and what does it represent? So as we look at things today, we're going to realize that Paul and Barnabas on this missionary journey, which was their first of three, they represented something. Now the people who didn't understand eternal things thought they represented something that was of legend. They thought that they represented something of myth. And uh, as, as Terry was reading a while ago, the last verse that he, said, he read says, they thought that these men must be gods. And it's using the 
the little g for gods because they actually thought that Paul and Barnabas were the myths, the legends come to life. Today I want you to learn something. I want you to learn about uh, the word icon and how it means little image of something else that is grander or broader. I want us to learn about their life and how Paul and Barnabas were icons for Christ. I want us to see that God gave a testimony in the midst of this set of passages and his testimony is clear and his testimony is something that you can hold on to. So I want you to see the evidence of his testimony and I want you to examine by the end uh, what the icon is or the image that you're portraying. And so I, I normally don't tell you ahead of time. I like to kind of blindside you with truths as we go on and give you the, the catch points, the hook points later. But I thought I'd tell you ahead of time what to look for. Now we're in Acts chapter 14 and we're going to go through quickly this story that is one story that's found in 28 verses. The Bible icons were set up thousands of years uh, ago and, and, and laid out for us, but they meant something. It means that everybody is representing something. Everybody in this room is representing something. So in Acts 13, uh, Paul and Barnabas were in this town uh, prior to that called Antioch, but they were in an Antioch called Antioch, Syria. The, we're going to see this morning that town that sent them out where they had been missionaries, they spent time, they had established a church there, the church was strong like our church, and they were sending out missionaries from that church. They then went over to a, uh, an area that is today Turkey, and in Turkey they called it in the Bible Asia Minor. There was another Antioch called Pisidian Antioch, and Pisidian Antioch is the Antioch that's mentioned most of the time until we get to the very end of the scriptures today. The reason that's important is because they faced persecution and abuse from Pisidian Antioch, but the Antioch that sent them out was always praying for them and supporting them, Syrian Antioch. It had been nice if they'd have used different names, but they didn't. I talked about that several weeks ago when we were in this. So to catch us up, in Acts 13, it's the first missionary journey that Paul got sent out on. He was sent out from this church that was established in Syrian Antioch. They headed out then across the land. They went to several different cities. Cities. We're going to mention some of those towns and cities today. But everywhere they went, it seemed that persecution arose against them. And so they were kicked out of a lot of cities. They were put in jail in cities. They were abused and they were beaten. And today we're going to see that Paul was stoned to death, or it seemed that he was dead when he got not when he got stoned, but when he got stoned, if when, he got, when he got hit by rocks, okay? So that's the picture today. There's a lot of people who have been stoned and you thought they were dead if you lived through the 60s. I did not live through the 60s. I was just a baby during that time, but I've heard stories about them. Acts chapter 14, verse 1 says it in this way. Acts chapter 14, verse 1, and I'm just going to walk through the scripture and, and give a little bit of clarity as we go. Acts 14, starting in verse 1 says these words. Let me flip right to it here. It says, at Iconium. Okay, I'm sorry. At Iconium. Did, he, did anybody remember what Jesus said about the coin? What was the word for, the Greek word for what you found in the image on the coin? Icon. This city was called Icon. Ium. Iconium. It meant it represented something. And what was represented in this whole region were the Greek gods, the gods of mythology, the gods of legend. And we're going to see how all that played together. They even had temples to these Greek gods in this area. Those Greek gods were supposedly what was protecting them, and yet they were just myth. They were just legend. No one had ever seen a miracle from a Greek god. No one had ever seen a a miracle from Jupiter or from Zeus or from, uh, from uh, Mercury or from Hermes, from these different gods that were there. They never saw a miracle from even the region that was named after a great god. They didn't see the miracles from any of those things, and yet they believed. Why? Because those people that lived in that region had a hole somewhere, somewhere in their spirit. They had a hole somewhere in their soul and in their heart, and that hole could only be filled by a creator, by a 
God. They could see the evidence of God that was around them, but they never had heard about the true living God. There were Jews that lived in that region, and they did not, they were so selfish about the things that they believed, and they were so uh, fixed on the fact that they had to do works in order to be uh, found of value to God that, that, that they didn't even share. It seemed that they were not even evangelistic sharing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they thought they were the chosen people and these people are the Gentiles. That's the way it was. So they didn't reach out to them, but they were involved in the culture. Let's look at it. At Iconium, the icon of the area, it was the capital city of that area. Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. They had just started their missionary journey, but they had spent time in other cities prior to this first missionary journey. And they already had a pattern, and that was to go, as Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, go first to the Jews, and then go to the Gentiles in the order in which he told them to spread that out. So they went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so effectively, they were so powerful in their speech that a great number of Jews and Greeks or Gentiles believed. They didn't just move into an area as good citizens and say, let's set up shop there, and let's be so, such good citizens that the people will... Uh, say, you must be a child of God because you're such a good person. They didn't wait for people to say, hey, tell me, uh, what is this Savior you talk about? They didn't wait and say, hey, tell me, what is this God you talk about? Paul and Barnabas went in there and they went to the place that they were to go first to spread the gospel from. Uh, because They went first to the Jews because the Jews already believed that there was a God and it wasn't Zeus. They believed in a creator. So they went to the, the most potential potentially fertile soil, and then they were spread out there. You see, when you go to somebody who doesn't believe that there's a God at all, you have to take them all the way back to the creation, as we're going to see in the scripture today. If you go to people who already were brought up in church or were brought up in believing that there's a God, you just tell them about the Savior and say, let me tell you, this one that you have believed in, a God, a creator, you can have a relationship with him. I can have a relationship with the creator. They already believe there's a creator. These people were not there. But when they went and shared with the Jews, as usual, the Jews refused to believe. Now, it just told us that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed, but the leadership obviously didn't. The Jews who refused to believe, as usual, stirred up other Gentiles and they poisoned their minds against the brothers, verse 2 says. These Jewish leaders did not want to lose their power, and so they intentionally poisoned the minds by bringing discredit to the work of Christ by speaking against Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas in verse 3, so they left the region, right? No, that's not what it says. It says, so Paul and Barnabas with this opposition that was rising against them, they spent considerable time there. Oh, really? You don't like us here? I'm going to be here anyway. Did anyone have a sister that was, uh, you were the brother, younger brother, and you had an older sister? Did you ever just annoy the fire out of her on purpose? I wouldn't have done this. But if there's anything that if she said, stop looking at me, where was your eyes going to be? Beep, looking right at her. And, and that was like what the Jews were feeling. I mean, we're bringing lies against these people and they are staring right at us. Paul and Barnabas were the most annoying things in the region at this time. And they didn't run. They didn't dust their feet off yet. They said, we're going to stay here because we've got a reason to be here. And the reason was in verse 3. They were to speak boldly for the Lord. And God confirmed their message of His grace. Their message was about His grace. And He confirmed this message of grace. And, and people were drawn to their words already. But it became even more powerful because He confirmed His message of grace by allowing them to do signs, wonders, and miracles. They were healing people. They were doing things that only a God could do. They were doing things that was impossible for mankind to do. The impossible became something that they were empowered with and that they were exercising. And this ability to perform miracles started to draw even greater crowds. And the Jews were getting very worried. And so the people of the city, verse 4 says, were divided. Some sided with the Jews, who were very much against this new way. And some uh, sided with the apostles. 
Paul and Barnabas and other individuals who were following Christ. The message of grace was pure. The miracles were undeniable. But the people were divided because some of them wanted to hang on to either those who were in power, i.e. the Jews, or they wanted to, or they just couldn't see past the, the things that they had been told by their granddad and their father and all of the folks that were in their lineage and history. So in verse 5, it says that those people that were against Paul and Barnabas, there was a plot afoot. This plot was, act, was in motion. Being afoot meant it was already in motion. And the plot that was afoot was among both the Gentiles and Jews who were not believers, who did not fall for the grace of God. We, God does not want to give us grace. we got to work for his favor. But that's not true. Paul was saying God will give you freely if you'll seek it. And it's because Jesus did the work and he completed that work on the cross. So together with the leaders of the, the, the opposition movement, they got together to mistreat and to stone, to beat, to persecute, and to end up stoning these Christians, Paul and Barnabas and those who were with them. But Paul and Barnabas found out about it in verse 6, and they fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe. Now we've got several cities mentioned here. Lyconia was the area, that's what they call this greater area. The greater Lyconia area had uh, the, had the uh, Iconium, it had Lystra, it had Derbe, it had other cities that will be mentioned here. They fled out to those other cities and to the countryside, and they were telling people about Jesus. They continued to preach the gospel, verse 7 says, and then in Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. I know that some of you have heard possibly that uh, the preacher of the Cowboy Church of Venice is lame. It has nothing to do with the fact that I can't walk. It's the fact that I st struggle in preaching. We have a lame preacher over there, but he's, he loves the people. Listen, this guy was not, he didn't tell bad jokes. He was not a person who struggled to speak. He was a guy that couldn't walk. And his inability to walk was evidenced by how he just sat there, the scripture says. They found out about it. They fled to this city and in Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth. He'd never walked. <clears throat> this baby had legs and this baby had arms. And this baby as he grew never learned to use his legs. If you don't use legs, what happens to the, the muscles? They are not there. I mean, they're still there, but they are not adequate. If you were going to teach someone who had never learned to walk how to walk, you'd have to teach them how to balance. You'd have to start doing some physical therapy to get those muscles active so those muscles would be able to support. And then you got to say, okay, let's put one foot in front of the other. When someone's been through an accident that affects their mind or in a fact, accident that affects their back or their limbs, then they have to retrain. This is an adult who has walked all of their life, and yet because of the accident they've been in or the war that they've been in, something was severed, something in communication was broken, and they have to learn to walk again. Their arms might work great, but even somebody who's walked all of their life after that accident cannot get the communication down there. But a miracle took place this day, and this one who had never walked before, the mother muscles had never supported him before. He never knew what it was like to balance himself. Uh, all of a sudden became healed. He had been that way from birth. Verse 9 says he, he was listening to Paul, what Paul was saying as he was speaking. And then Paul looked directly at him. And, and this guy just had this face that, that was just, it was just glowing. Sometimes whenever I'm, I'm teaching in different settings or, or preaching here, if I say something that, it, that is an aha moment, for you, then all of a sudden I'll see some people smile like, ah, oh, I get it. And I remember uh, times in my life, many times whenever I've done that, sometimes when I'm preparing on Sunday, I'm sitting there in my chair alone studying as I'm putting these things together, and all of a sudden I have to just smile and go, oh, and I laugh out loud sometimes because it's just so real, it's just so good. This guy was doing that. He was radiating faith. He knew that what they were saying was true. He might have heard about the miracles. We don't even know if other miracles have taken place in this area. This is the only one that's mentioned. But God had empowered Paul and Barnabas, not just with the words of his grace that were making people children of God because they were believing in Jesus, but there was something even empowering. There was a spiritual electricity that allowed individuals who had never walked before to walk. 
So verse 9, he listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, and Paul saw that this man had faith to be healed. He had that aha going on in him. Now his faith was not in Paul. His faith was in the message Paul was delivering. If his faith was in Paul, he would be believing in something that was temporal, because Paul was just in a temporal body. But Paul was speaking about something that was eternal, and this man took in, held onto, and believed in that. And it wouldn't have mattered if he ever walked again. He was going to believe and he was going to put his faith in what Paul was saying, not because there was a potential for walking, it's because he understood there was a potential for forgiveness. He understood there was a potential for eternal life and he was hanging on to that. And Paul called out to him, he said, hey lame man, and, and the lame man went over here, now I don't know if he said that really, but it says Paul called out in verse 10, stand up on your feet and he knew that he was talking to him and at that moment the man jumped up and began to walk. This guy had never jumped in his life. He had never balanced. There's no evidence that he has ever walked in his life. The scripture says he was lame from birth, which meant those legs didn't know how to jump. Those legs didn't have muscles that were capable of jumping. The atrophy of something that had never been in his legs meant that muscles had to be teeny tiny, itsy bitsy weensy like my arms. But it was not like that. It was something that a miracle took place and not only did his muscles have the ability to stay Stand him up. The muscles had the ability to cause him to leap. The muscles had the ability and the memorization to not have to go through the, the uh, physical therapy period. But the muscles were allowing him to balance. And his mind didn't have to be trained, uh, all right, take this step, take this step. It just took place. This is a greater miracle than what you can understand unless you take time to think about it. When the crowd saw what took place, obviously the power of God. Folks that didn't know God saw something that took place that only God could do. No man could have done what took place that day. This was a miracle. They had never seen a miracle. They believed in Zeus. They believed in Jupiter. They believed in Mercury. They believed in, in Hermes. They believed in uh, Lycone. They believed in all of these Greek gods and yet they had never seen a miracle. They were putting their faith in something that they had never seen evidence of and all of a sudden Paul and Barnabas were there. I don't care if they believed in Jupiter, in Mercury, in Pluto or Goofy. None of those things were going to be of value to them if there was no power in it and those myths had no power. Those legends had no effect those legends had no power over them. But these two dudes, Paul and Barnabas, were empowered like gods. Remember what it said? These men. Oh, when the crowd saw what Paul had done in verse 11, they shouted in the Lyconian language, which we don't know what the Lyconian language was. It was something that the region had right there. But the Lyconian language, they said, the gods have come down for, um, for us in human form. The gods have come down to us in human form. The myths and legends have come to life. They are real. Look, it must be. And then they looked at old man Barnabas. Barnabas was the one that took Paul under his wing and, and he was a man that of the Pharisees who had had such uh, credit, such merit, such a history that the others said, okay, we'll accept Paul in even though he used to persecute Christians. Paul, uh, Barnabas was an older man and they looked at Barnabas and they said, this man must be Zeus. Verse 12 says, Barnabas, they called Zeus. Some of your translations might say Jupiter instead of Zeus because those were, those were uh, the same individual, the same God. It was an older supreme deity. And Paul they called Hermes or Mercurius, the younger god. The Mercury was a god that was known as a younger god of eloquence, the ability to speak, the ability to, to, uh, to share with people and to, to wax mythological even in his speech. But So this one who was Paul was the one who was speaking, and he was much younger than Barnabas, old Zeus. And so they said, this younger god of eloquence must be, who is the chief speaker, must be called Hermes, or Mercurius, if your Bible translates that that way. So the priest, there was a priest of Zeus. Now, I told you that the cities believed in these Greek gods, these mythological gods. The Jews didn't mind that. They knew that they were the chosen people, and so they didn't even mess with the, the gods of these mythological gods, because 
because the Gentiles were dogs anyway. They were going to go to hell anyway because they weren't part of the chosen people. So the Jews were not evangelistic in what they were doing. So these cities that were, many of them, named after Greek gods had Greek temples in them. And this priest came from a Greek temple that was named after Zeus. The, the temples of Zeus had two different functions and I read about them but I don't remember what they were. But protection was one of them and something else, enlightenment or something else like this. This priest of Zeus... Uh, he'd never met Zeus. He was believing in something that, that did not have an emotional tie, or all that it might have had was an emotional tie. It didn't have a reality tie. There was no proof of it. That's why the proof of Christ and his resurrection is so important to us. The fact that he showed himself to those believers afterwards, after he came out of the grave. That never happened with Zeus. And this priest of Zeus whose temple was just outside the city, uh, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifice to them. He said, these are the gods come down. It has to be the gods of Zeus. It has to be the gods of Mercurius or Hermes. And they brought these sacrifices and they were going to sacrifice these animals before these who came down from heaven somehow in a human form to do things because that's all that they knew they were trusting in and believing in all that they knew there are individuals today that are believing in and trusting in uh, things that are are not only not scientific not scriptural not historical like the bible is but because that's what mommy and daddy told them and so they're believing in individuals who were human beings as their gods or as their links to a God that is not even real. And that's what they were believing about these things. So when verse 14 says, when the apostles Paul and Barnabas heard about people wanting to bring and offer sacrifices to them, they tore their clothes. They just take their shirt and they just pull the buttons right off and they, they tore their clothes and Paul and Barnabas rushed in, out into the crowd and they said, friends, why are you doing this? We're only human. We're just like you. We're just human beings. We're bringing you good news. They were bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're bringing you good news, which means the gospel message, telling you to turn from these worthless things. These are things that have never been of benefit to you, and yet you're trusting in them. Let us tell you about someone who can be of benefit to you. Let us tell you about somebody who could raise the dead, who can heal the sick. Let us tell you about somebody who can forgive your sins. You are completely unworthy to enter into the house of God, which is heaven, and yet you can be forgiven so that you can qualify to go into a perfectly pure place with forgiven sins. It seems impossible. Why are you doing this? We're only human. We're bringing you this good news about uh, the living God, that you would turn from the worst, worthless things to the living God. And and this living God, and now they, remember, these people didn't believe in, in the God who was a creator. So they went all the way back to the beginning. This is how you speak to someone who does not believe in God. They said, God made the heavens and the earth. And he made the sea and everything that is in them. God is real. He is living. He has created everything. And he is everything to me. And he's everything and can be everything to you. He was everything to the universe. And the evidence is all around. His testimony is here. In the past, he let all nations go their way and he gave a chosen people and I think they were probably thinking all the way back to the first 2,000 years between Adam and Noah before Abraham and then it says in verse 17 even though he let all nations go his way even then he did not leave himself without testimony he has shown kindness through the ages to mankind by giving rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. Have you ever watched something that was a seed grow into a tree and bear fruit and nuts fall everywhere? He provides you with plenty of food. He fills your heart with joy. Everything is from God. His testimony is all around us. And we are the living evidence of one who cares enough so much that, that, that he is allowing us to walk out our steps in service for him. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 or verse 20 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen so that men are without excuse. I was talking to someone yesterday about the evidence of God 
And if somebody says, can you prove to me that there's a God, the first question that you would have to ask, think on this, is what proof will you accept? You need to ask them, what proof will you accept? Can you tell the difference in something that is random and something that is orderly? That would be the question. If you can tell the difference in a bunch of rocks laying out in a field that it seems that water has run over, and then those rocks, because the water has run over them, are just spread out out there, and the dirt has been uncovered because of the water running over them, if you can tell the difference in that and a pile of rocks, then you can see the evidence of God. If you see a pile of rocks, you know that it didn't happen by random happenstance. If you see a brick house and all the bricks are laid in order, then you know that there was a creator evident there. If you see a pile of rocks, you know that the little boy had been evident there. And the little boy was the creator of what that was. He stacked the rocks up and he threw some of them and then he went on home. He looked for a glass bottle to throw it, but he couldn't find one. That's just what little boys do. But that's the destructive part of us, guys. If you can tell the difference in something that has order, because somebody put it in order, and something that is random, then you can see the evidence of God all around us. So God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His God divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by things that we know are not random. Things that had to be done orderly by somebody's hand. That's the evidence of the Creator. I'm not going to go into greater depth of that, but that's what they were preaching to these people. And even with these words, verse 18 says that those folks who were listening had difficulty, uh, or, or I'm sorry, Paul and Barnabas had difficulty because the people still wanted to bring sacrifices to them. The words that you're saying sound phenomenal, but you have to be a God because what you did only a God could do. They were doing that because they were empowered by the God, not because they were gods. They were doing that because they were obedient to, and then God stepped in and said, let me empower what you are doing. And God empowered what they were doing, and they were able to do things that are impossible, that always have been impossible for mankind to do, unless an individual was empowered by God. There's not an individual in all of this world, there's not an individual on this earth who has the ability at their discretion to say to someone, Someone who has never walked, get up and walk, and the person jumps up and can balance themselves and walk. It's not being done. It wasn't being done then either, and yet it happened when Paul and Barnabas were there. Well, verse 19 says, Then some of the Jews came from Pisidian Antioch. Remember, this Antioch is different than the one that sent them out on this mission. Some of the Jews came from this place that, that Paul and Barnabas had been expelled from, that they had been kicked out of, and those Jews came from Pisidian Antioch and Iconium, and they won the crowd over. In other words, they said, these guys are not gods. They're of the devil. And they won the crowd over believing in what they were saying. And then they stoned Paul. They used, the way stonings were done is they would sit somebody in a pit or outside, maybe they might tie them and they sit them outside of something that had a higher place. They would take large rocks, maybe large enough for a man, maybe two, to drop over them so that they would be crushed to death. They didn't just take little pebbles and throw it at them. They, they might have taken things that were big enough for them to, to throw, but the fact is that this was something that broke bones, that killed people. Death was the outcome of anybody being stoned in this way. So they dragged him outside the city to this place where uh, he was to be stoned. And there it says they saw him as dead. They thought that he was dead. It doesn't tell us that he wasn't dead, actually, but it says that they thought that he was dead. But then all of the followers, the disciples, those who had believed in, in Jesus, gathered around him. It seems from the King James Version, they just stood around him. They were looking and praying, possibly. We don't know, but they were standing around him. And all of a sudden, Paul went, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> and, and he got up and he said, let's go back to the city. This is a crazy miracle. This man either came back from the dead or he, he that with those broken bones of being stoned, now stood up, shook himself off. The scripture tells us in other places as he talks about himself that I bear in my body the marks of the message of Jesus Christ. He was a man that was not without scars. He was a man that was not without uh, a morphed body because of the things that he faced. He was not a God and his body was completely human. But God said, you're not done yet. 
And Paul said, thank you, let's go back. And he went back. It didn't say he wasn't bleeding. It didn't say that he was perfect. It said that he was empowered. And somehow the pains that he had were not greater than his ability and God's ability to stand him up. After the disciples gathered around in verse 20, says he got up and he went back into the city. It's interesting, Paul didn't flee this time. See, he was expelled from uh, Pisidian Antioch. They got away from Iconium, but, but he didn't flee this time. He went back into the city to return to show that God's power was evident. And not that he was a God, but that he represented the living God. The next day he and Barnabas then left for Derby, and they moved on to share the gospel. Verse 21 says that they preached the gospel in in that city of Derby, they won a large number of disciples, which are followers of Jesus. And then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They went back to the very places where he was stoned. Again, they went back to the very places that had expelled him. They went back to the very places that were tied up with this mindset of Zeus and Hermes. They went back. Why did they go back? Because some of the people believed there. They went back to strengthen the believers, the disciples. They didn't want the, the believers to go, maybe this isn't a real God. And so they went back to say, he is a real God. And we're still serving him. And he's still faithful to us. And he's just as real from the past as he is today. The day that you accepted him, I want to encourage you, is the day that began your eternal life. And they put their faith in Christ. And Paul had a responsibility to go back and to empower those disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Don't give up. Press on. It's going to be worth it. We must go on. And then he said in verse 22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You have to go through hardships to enter the kingdom of God? Possibly the most profound statement in the verses that we read today. What does that mean? How many hardships did they have to go through in order to be saved? None. They didn't have to be put on a cross in order to be saved. They had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He did the work. When he said it is finished on the cross, the price was paid. He had done the price. He paid the price. They didn't have to do the work. So when it says here, Paul said we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, he couldn't have been saying we have to, you have to go through hardships in order to be saved or to go to heaven. He said literally, you must go through many hardships to enter the reign of God. You need to take up the responsibilities of Jesus Christ because one day we're going to stand before Christ and some individuals are going to be told, well done, good and faithful servant. And some individuals are going to be told, well, you're saved. But as 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, you're saved, but you will suffer loss. See, there's things you could have had, responsibilities that you could have had in the kingdom of heaven. To some, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler. The word kingdom means ruler or reign. To enter the kingdom of God, he's going to choose those who have been faithful walking in life. This is what it means Challenge it, study it, and, and, and prove it wrong if you can. You will find that it's true. It is not hard to be saved. You receive the gift of God that is free. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says it is by grace we have been saved. It's a gift of God. Nobody does anything for a gift. Ain't, nobody ain't got time for that. <laughs> nobody does anything for a gift. It is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and you are saved. And then verse 10 of Ephesians 2 and 8, 9 and 10 says, For, it is, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to serve, to do good works for which God has called us heavenward. You see, God has called us to serve him for a reason. During this boot camp of life that is temporary, he's saying, how will you be a steward of the things I've placed in your care? Because I've got an eternal reign. I've got an eternal staff that needs to be filled up. You see, the angels are reigning in the heavens right now, but they're going to lay down those positions and they're going to be seated around the throne of God by their thousands of ten thousands, praising God day and night forever and ever. Amen. Thank God we're not angels. That sounds a little boring. 
Sorry, God. I'm just saying that if we were just singing forever and ever, at some point, I'm going to be snoring forever and ever. But that's not the way it is. He said, I want you to take up those positions of the reign of the heavens. And Paul said, concerning taking up those positions that the angels will lay down of the heaven, reign of the heavens or the kingdom of God, he said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. There are verses, there's a verse, and I'm going to jump ahead. There's a verse, um, I've got it written down here, and I'm going to mess it up. There's a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, 11 and 12, that says, If we died with him, we will reign with him. I mean, if we, had, if we died with him, then we will live with him. In other words, if we die to Christ, we're going to have a resurrection. That's our salvation. We die to ourselves, and we know that we're going to have a resurrection to come. But the very next verse says, verse 12 of 2 Timothy 2 says, if we endure with him, then we will reign with him. See, in order to be saved, we lay down our life. He picks it up and he gives us eternal life. But he's watching those who have eternal life to say, are you an icon of Satan? Or are you an icon of Jesus? When people touch your life or come in contact with your life, do you link them to Jesus Christ by your words? Do you link them to Jesus Christ by your actions? Do you link them to Jesus Christ by your grace? Or are you an individual that is so linked to the world that that's all that what people see in you? Verse 23 through 28 says, Paul and Barnabas then appointed elders for those different cities and the churches. And in each church, they appointed elders to help, help other individuals walk through with prayer and fasting, then they committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. They had already put their trust in the Lord. After going through another town called Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word of God in Perga, they went down to another city called Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch. And this Antioch is home. This Antioch is where that church is that loved them enough to pray for them. This is the place that, that they had served for several years. And then they were sent out as missionaries to start other churches and other towns that didn't know anything about the living God and Jesus Christ. So they came home in verse 26. And when they had been committed, or they came home where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work, and I love this, for the work that now had been completed. They completed this first missionary journey. They came home. They had done everything they were supposed to do. Verse 28 and 20, I mean 27, 28 says, on arriving there at Antioch, they gathered the church together and they reported, they told everything that had taken place, just like somebody who's gone out on mission comes back and says, let me tell you what God did. They reported all that God had done through them, how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, even the Gentiles. And then they stayed a long time there in Syria and Antioch once again with the disciples. Paul later wrote about these same cities in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. He said to Timothy, who was a young minister, who was growing in a point now of responsibility where he was teaching other ministers. And in 2 Timothy verse 3, verse 10, I mean chapter 3, verse 10 through 14, it says, Paul said, you, Timothy, know all about my teaching. You know about my way of life. You know about my purpose. You know about my faith and my patience, my love and my endurance. You know about the persecutions and the sufferings that I went through. What kinds of things that happened to me over in Antioch, that Pisidian Antioch, in Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Remember me telling you about, oh, look at this scar. This is the one that I got when I got stoned in Antioch. I mean, in, uh, in um, whatever city he was in. Yet the Lord rescued me. The Lord rescued me from all of them. The Lord was with him through the toughest trials of life. And the Lord has promised to be with us also. I will never leave you or forsake you, Jesus said in John 10, and nobody can take you out of my hand. And I and the Father are one, and no one can take you out of my Father's hand. I love that. He said, God carried on with me through all of these things, and he reported all that God had done through them, how God had opened the door, and he stayed with them a long time. As he said, the Lord rescued me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen. Evildoers, imposters are going to go from bad to worse. Deceiving, being deceived. But Timothy, as for you, Cowboy Church of Venice, as for you, continue in the faith. Continue in what you've learned. Be a steward of what God has placed in your care. Uh, you see, it seems like Paul and Barnabas' missionary and their ministry life 
was always fraught with persecutions. It seemed like they, always, they, they were always being beaten or they're put in jail or something else. I told you that at the beginning. And you'd say that, that, well, that's unique to them somehow, but it's not unique to just them. Guess who else had a ministry that was covered with persecutions? Jesus Christ did. And if Christ went through persecutions, then I understand a little better of what it's meaning. We must endure with him. Because if we're standing for Christ, we're going to go through persecutions. Matthew 5 verse 11 said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus said, because if you're being persecuted because of me, blessed are you. Peter wrote about that in Second Peter, first and second Peter. And then he said in Matthew 5 12, after he just said, Blessed are you when you're persecuted, he said, Rejoice and be glad. Even in the midst of persecution, rejoice and be glad, because great is your your reward in heaven because it matters. They endured even through the persecutions. Here's the conclusion and I'm almost done. We're not given opportunities in the physical life just to be selfish hoarders of the physical things, our time, our ability, our resources. I just want to live in this little bubble over here. We need to be like Paul and Barnabas. Whatever area that we walk, we need to be icons for Jesus. We need to be images of Christ. We've not been given eternal life just to be lazy or selfish or prideful or to be judgmental against other people, saved or unsaved. Remember that coin with the icon on it? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's? If you look down at your hands or you look at the details on the internet of the, of the workings of your body, realize it, it, it has blown my mind many times in life that we don't have to be plugged into anything in order to be self-sufficient and to walk. We walk around freely. We are cordless individuals. And the reason we're cordless individuals is because there's a miracle that God has done making us individuals in this way. So the last verses I want to read for you are about how we are to be icons. And it literally uses the Greek word icon, though I'm going to say the word image in these. Romans 8, 29 says, For those that God foreknew, He also predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son, or the icon of His Son. He predestined us to look like His Son. He created mankind to look like His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49 says, And as we have borne the image, the icon of earthly man, we shall one day also bear the image or the icon of the heavenly man. So just like we have earthly bodies, one day we're going to have heavenly bodies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And we all today, with unveiled faces, so that people can see the real us, Reflect the Lord's glory in our compassion. Reflect the Lord's glory in, in His grace flowing through us. And we're being transformed more and more every day. It's an ongoing process. We're being transformed into the icon or the image of Christ with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit in us. The Lord and the Spirit one. So the question is, when, and I've asked you this already, when you're standing in life, walking at a restaurant, at a store, working, whether you work outside, inside, at home when you wake up or you sit down to a meal, and individuals ask you a question, do you, because asking you a question is like on the computer, pushing the icon button. And if they ask you a question, you go, what do you want? I'm just saying... Uh, you are not reflecting Jesus. They pushed your button, and your button was behind that icon. I'm sorry if anybody has a bad heart, because that might have caught you off guard. Your button was one that was so sensitive. That happens when you're driving sometimes. That happens when you're thinking. That happens when you're walking. It's just bad. But what God wants of us is when people look at us, when they somehow come into contact or push our buttons, may we link them to Jesus Christ. And if you've never accepted him as your Savior, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said it clearly. He said, I am the way to heaven. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one's going to get to the Father except by me. He never lied. He's the only one who said it. And there's no other way. The way to heaven is to believe on Jesus Christ. The way to reign in his kingdom is to endure with him and to be an icon for him as you walk. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the truth of your word and for the beauty of the simplicity of taking uh, a name of a city from a Greek word meaning image and realizing that that was the message for today.
The picture of Paul and Barnabas' journey was one that, that just showed us an example of what it means to be an icon for Christ. When you go through persecutions, get up and go back. When you go through trials, get up and go back because there will be fruit born at every stage, at every level. We don't have the ability to do signs, wonders, and miracles at our discretion, but you still do, God, and we're grateful for that. But because we don't have the ability to do it at our own discretion, may we be like the first few verses that talked about Paul and Barnabas. All they did was preach Jesus. All they did was bring the good news of the gospel to a people who needed forgiveness, needed a covering of their sins. And because of that, many disciples believed. May you use us. And may one day when we get to stand before you, may we hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. And we'll give you the glory for the journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glad you're here today. God bless you as you go.